Unit two, lesson three. So this is gonna be really familiar. Um, it's basically what we've already done in language arts, just sort of applying it to social studies instead. Um, so I'll move through it kind of quickly. Uh, you know, you're, it's gotta be real familiar because this is something that we just covered maybe about a week and a half ago. And uh, we'll kind of focus on more of the historical content, um, you know, using it through the lens of, of thinking about main ideas and details. Uh, so again, it'll feel kind of familiar and <laughs> it's building on what we've been doing. It's adding another sort of tool set. So we looked at maps as a way to analyze information. We looked at interpreting tables. Um, for this one, you know, it's, it's going to be about interpreting the text that we read that goes along with that and some, you know, a tool that's going to cross over between social studies and language arts. So uh, for today, by the time we finish, we're going to be able to identify the main idea of a paragraph like we've done before, identify the topic sentence of a paragraph, uh, and identify the supporting details in a paragraph. But of course, um, it'll all feel familiar and we'll try to focus more on the historical part of it because it's all about history today. All right, and we'll go through our audio really quickly here. The main idea is the most important point of a passage or paragraph. The main idea may come at the beginning, middle, or end of a passage or paragraph. A main idea may be implied or clearly stated. If it is implied, Use reasoning and supporting details to determine the main idea. If it is clearly stated, you are likely to find it within the topic sentence or the first or last sentence of a given paragraph. Supporting details provide additional information or facts about the main idea. Such details include facts, statistics, explanations, graphics, and descriptions. As with other areas of the GED test, Questions about the main idea and details of a passage will test your ability to interpret information at various depth of knowledge levels through the use of complex reading and thinking skills. Yep, and you know, as we saw in language arts, uh, it's basically the, the most important points of a, of a sentence or, or a paragraph is that main idea. Uh, in a paragraph, we have a topic sentence that's going to uh, it, it, you know, all the rest of the, the, the sentences in the paragraph are framed around this idea. You know, it's the focal point. It's the gravity of the paragraph. And those supporting details are what, you know, back up that topic set. So just uh, rehashing something that we're, we've already ran into. Um, and so a little bit of text here to get into. Um, <clears throat> so in 1620, a group of colonists set sail aboard the Mayflower to start the second colony on England's land in the New World. Before going ashore, the colonists wrote and signed the following agreement from the Mayflower Compact of 1620. So this piece here says, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, have, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, <laughs> do solemnly and mutually combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought, convenient for the general good of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. So <laughs> and I mentioned this before, you know, uh, we, we sort of think of the pilgrims as being you know, the first, first Europeans here, but they were, you know, second as far as British uh, sort of or, um, origins. Uh, Jamestown was established in 1607 and the Mayflower didn't get here until about 13 years later. Um, and, you know, they came here because of religious persecution, basically. They were ultra, 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 ultra conservative purists. 
super, super, super uh, Calvinists. And um, uh, the, the church in England was uh, much more liberal at that time. And um, they got bounced around because they were uh, criticized for being just super, 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 super conservative uh, in their religion and, and real old school, you could say. So, um, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't celebrate Christmas even, um, because, uh, God didn't tell us when Jesus was born. That's, that's the type of, of, of religiosity we're dealing with in, uh, the, the, the pilgrims, the people that came over on the Mayflower. Uh, but just to <laughs> finish up here. So w- what we have here is sort of like their constitution or their, um, uh, pact. This is their doctrine that's going to sort of bind them together and, uh, you know, sort of instruct how they're going to govern themselves in this in the Mayflower Compact. And uh, just to follow up here, so right under underlined is the main idea um, expresses the key point of the passage, right? So combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation. You got that kind of old school language in there, the old English, but, uh, you know, it's basically saying that, you know, we are joining together to basically start governing ourselves. And uh, a supporting detail being that, you know, uh, to frame such just and equal laws, uh, more detail to that point of how they're going to do that and that constitute and frame such just and equal laws. All right. And we'll slide over to the quiz. So student book, unit two, lesson three, main idea and details. I feel this one will go pretty quick today. All right, so I'm gonna start the quiz here. Uh, And again, same passage, Mayflower Compact of 1620. Uh, are using logic text box says one way that a writer may add supporting details for a main idea is to cite examples from history that show an earlier precedent for his or her argument. Um, so, uh, you know, you think about the, the Gettysburg Address, uh, you know, Lincoln talks about, you know, four score and seven years ago. Uh, and, it, you know, he's talking about the founding fathers there and what they were building. Uh, so there's a lot of that's one way history is often used is to support an argument because we show uh, a historical precedent where that happened, just like a, a precedent in law uh, when that's established. Yeah, um, like we talked about uh, Brown versus Board of Education. There's this precedent established in history uh, for civil rights at that point. And, and you know, they look at these court cases all the time to see where a historical ruling kind of uh, judge it, you know, sets a, a tone for what's going to happen afterward. So that's sort of what we're dealing with here. Um, so question one in the quiz, which ideal in U.S. history is expressed in the Mayflower Compact? Is it A, the establishment of religious freedom, B, the growth of self-government, C, cooperation between the colonies, or D, independence from England? What's represented in the Mayflower Compact? <clears throat> Anyone want to take a shot? A. B. B is in boy. Yeah. So self governance, right? That's that's really what's outlined there is that we are going to govern ourselves. Uh, we come together to combine this body politic. Uh, so. Uh, in order to self-govern. So, and that's right, that's sort of an ideal that has, uh, that, you know, it's a thread all through the history in North America since the arrival of, of Europeans, right? That we are going to govern ourselves and it was established here. It was something that would be cited uh, or, or looked upon later um, once we get into the era of, of uh the American Revolution, right? This idea that the pilgrims came here uh, for ideas like freedom of religion, but to govern themselves and not be governed by others. And that is a really key point. And it it, it does really run a thread all through American history. Uh, it's something that we promote abroad 
it's something that we promoted with like Woodrow Wilson and his 14 points. Uh, we, we want others, not just ourselves, to be self-governed. And we fought for that um, through history. So B as in boy for the growth of self-government, number one. Okay, and we have a table here. We're gonna start sort of seeing multiple tools in play, multiple uh, forms of information coming at us. So uh, you can see here, it's the numbers of signers uh, of the, well, let's read the text here. So a total of 56 men from 13 colonies representing New England, the middle colonies and the Southern colonies signed the Declaration of Independence. And remember yesterday I talked about, uh, we, we saw, you know, the, the, the New England colonies of like Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Maine, uh, and then, you know, where the middle colonies are situated and what's considered the Southern colonies. <laughs> and basically Virginia and typically Maryland is considered Southern. Uh, and then the signers ranged in age from 26 to 70 and included two future presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. So we're dealing with the signees here, the 56 uh, men uh, and how many basically from each uh, colony at that point. So there are four from Connecticut, three from Delaware, three from Georgia and so on. So our question is, which two colonial regions were equally represented in the signing of the Declaration of Independence, suggesting both their power and importance? Was it New England, Middle Colonies, or the, well, we know it's two, so which, of, which two of these three, the New England Colonies, Middle Colonies, or Southern Colonies? The Middle and the Southern. What, what what was that? The middle colonies and the southern colonies. Yeah, the middle colonies and the southern. Uh, you might have to do a little math there. And this is one of those ideas where you have yeah. to build on your former knowledge, right? So we talked about the middle colonies, the southern colonies, and, and New England. Um, so you're going to have to know where to divide those. And, uh, of course, they don't make it easy because they're all mixed up here, right? Rhode Island would be New England. Pennsylvania would be a middle colony. North Carolina would be a southern colony. But once you can kind of separate them, you'll find out that the middle colonies, M-I-D-D-L-E-C-O-L-O-N-I-E-S, and southern colonies, You know what, I'm just going to put middle and southern, and we'll hope that it accepts that as the right answer. Okay. So middle and southern there for number two. All right. <laughs> and so new passage here. Uh, war between Britain and its colonies began on April 19, 1775 but few Americans wanted to break from Britain. Instead, most colonists wanted to gain rights under the British government. As the war continued, however, many Americans began to want economic freedom in addition to personal liberty. On April 12, 1776, North Carolina's delegates voted for independence, and a month later, Virginia delegates did the same. In June 1776, a committee created a document entitled the Declaration of Independence that explained the need for independence. From the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish and to institute new government, laying its foundation of such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Uh, and, you know, we the, the Declaration of Independence basically did Two things, it established the 13 colonies break from uh, the British Empire and uh, longer, which we don't often see, you know, we, we, we see this piece quite a bit, um, you know, that, that opening. Um, 
but it was also an indictment of King George III and basically the what they felt were the, I guess you could say, crimes that he was committing against um, the uh, the colonists. Um, so anyway, the details in this passage support which of the following main ideas. Uh, a, war broke out in 1775, colonists wanted independence from Britain. B, uh, North Carolina and Virginia's delegates were at odds over independence. C, the colonists were cautious uh, or cautiously approached independence. Or D, Virginia led the movement for independence. Which one best fits there? B, is that what I heard? Okay. It's C, C is in cat. Uh, if you look at the, at the first part there, right? It says few Americans wanted to break from Britain. Instead, most colonists wanted to gain rights under the British government. And that, that was, that's, you know, really, even, even in this line uh, where it says that all men are created equal, there was a feeling among uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and the others that when they say all men are created equal, at that time they were believed that all British citizens should be treated equal because th that was really what drove them to independence was this feeling that they were not being treated as equal British citizens uh, as the colonists, uh, that, there, that there was not equal treatment. So um, th there was a, 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 a pretty good effort, you know, trying to stay within the British system um, before uh, we broke away. And there was a lot of British sympathizers still during uh, the war. And a lot of them uh, went to Canada too. Uh, so C for number three, C is in cat. I think we only have four today for the quiz. Uh, so uh, again, our Declaration of Independence passage, uh, what is the main idea in this excerpt from the Declaration of Independence, that uh, all men are endowed with an unalienable rights, B, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are important freedoms, C, King George III of Britain was a tyrant, or D, people have the right to end destructive governments and form new ones. B? B? It's D, D is in dog. <clears throat> so yeah, along the way there, that's basically the idea uh, right, right here, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. So that's the, that's the main idea, uh, at least one of the two main ideas. And the one we're most familiar with, uh, with the uh, Declaration of Independence, that people have the right to end destructive governments and form new ones. And that ties back into the um, um, the the idea of self governments that that has existed since the time of the pilgrims, right? Okay, give me one second here. All right, so let me get. Um, Let me submit I just this. Got here. I need one and two. Don't okay, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to review for you here. Matt? What was that? I was saying don't submit it yet because it didn't accept the middle and southern. Oh, did it not? Okay, well, let me look no. and see what they want. Okay, I'm looking at it right now. Okay, for starters, one is B is in boy, and. Um, two is what it's showing me here. It says right here is the, supposed to be the correct answer. It says middle and Southern colony. So I guess try putting in middle for the first blank and Southern colonies for the second. I, it, it kind of bums me out that they try to be so precise with a, a fill in the blank like that. Like there should be a range of correct, you know, answers middle colonies the middle colonies anything like that should work but they're very picky so try middle and southern colonies make sure you put southern colonies and see if that works okay and number three is 
C. That didn't work. Middle and Southern colonies. I didn't get points for it. Really? Yeah. And I, I don't think I spelled anything wrong. Well, see this. No, Middle and Southern colonies. No, no. Yeah. It didn't work. Unless, unless it's supposed to be the middle colonies. But again, you know, sometimes they just, you know, they don't work. Um, and we know what the right answer is. So it's frustrating, but we'll just, we'll just move on knowing that it's, you know, it's, it's on their end, not on ours. Um, but anyway, yeah, so middle and Southern colonies or some combination of that is the right answer for number two. Uh, number three is C as in cat. And number four was D as in dog. Okay. And um, I'm going to type those into the chat too. So one is B. I missed a number two. one. Middle. One is B. And three is C. Four is D. So I put it there in the chat too. You guys can see it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and slide over to the workbook. <laughs> so unit two, lesson three. Okay. And again, you know, the main idea is the most important point of a passage or any piece of writing. Uh, supporting details provide additional information about the main idea. So we'll go into the workbook here. Oh, let's see. Okay, I thought we had some more text. Okay, so yeah, we have some text down here. Uh, the original territory of the United States, as defined by the treaties of November 30th, 1782, and September 3rd, 1783, with Great Britain, was bounded on the north by Canada, on the south by the Spanish colonies of East and West Florida, on the east by the Atlantic Ocean and on the west by the Mississippi River. It included the 13 original colonies and the areas claimed by them. One of the difficult problems of the nation, of the new nation, was the existence of extensive unoccupied territory between the 13 uh, original colonies and the Mississippi River. Seven of the colonies claimed large parts of this territory and some of the claims were conflicting. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've mentioned that, you know, there was a lot of land out there that uh, was ceded by Britain, right? We saw a map before of the land that was ceded and basically handed over to the new country, to the new United States, when we won the war uh, that wasn't necessarily occupied by, you know, uh, settlers at that point. And we also know that that led to tension with uh, Native Americans along the way. <clears throat> so we have, uh, oh, it's trying to start me down towards the bottom. So make sure you scroll up to the top. It did the same thing to you. Uh, yeah, so it's the same passage as this read there, the original 13 colonies and the rest of the territory. And we've seen this map before. Uh, we saw it a while back here. So, right, uh, everything west to the Mississippi River was also ceded by Britain. That was Britain's claim up until the point of the American Revolution. And then down here, West Florida, East Florida uh, was Spanish territory. That was still controlled by Spain at that point at the Ameri during the American Revolution. Uh, and then, you know, there was some disputed territory. Uh, and then, you know, this whole you know, the dark green areas, what was the original 13 colonies, you can see Georgia, right? You can see how small the initial Georgian colony was. Uh, and then in that light green area is what they're saying is disputed territory between some of these colonies as they expanded. Same thing here with Virginia, right? Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, pretty much the same borders they have today, uh, but Virginia is gonna expand westward. Uh, Pennsylvania is going to expand westward, New York, I think maybe, and um, definitely Georgia. Uh, and that's what they're talking about here is, is what's going to happen along the way. And uh, our text box says uh, a writer may support 
a main idea with a graphic, such as a map, to understand the relationships among ideas. Look for connections between the passage and the graphic. So, question number one here, what is the main idea of the passage? We just read about the original territories. A, the colonies were in conflict with Great Britain over parts of Canada. B, there were disputed land claims among the colonies. C, the colonies were arguing with Spain over ownership of West and East Florida. Or D, there were conflicting claims among the colonies over land west of the Mississippi River. B, B is in boy, yeah. There were disputes, right? Uh, it wasn't all, um, you know, settled just because the war was over. There were certainly disputes among the states as well. So B, as in boy, disputed land claims among the colonies. And uh, same passage, same map. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it just tells us again, we have that key, right? So always make sure to look at the key. It has some major cities uh, where the 13 colonies were, where disputed territory was, and where the conflicting land would be. Uh, so question two here, how does the map provide a supporting detail for the main idea in the passage? So A, uh, it shows the 13 colonies. B, it shows West and East Florida. C, it shows the large size of the unoccupied territory. Or D, it shows the Great Lakes uh, it shows that the Great Lakes border Canada. C, yeah, C is in cat. So that, um, yeah, shows how much that territory was actually ceded. You know, we never really considered the fact that there was more territory that wasn't part of the actual colonies that British had claimed. Uh, for uh, United or for North America, I guess I should say. Okay, three. All right, now a new passage. So to study the passage and the map, then select the answer to the question. So this is from William S. Stikers, an eyewitness account of the Battle of Trenton. He mentioned the Battle of Trenton uh, not that long ago as well. So December 27th, 1776. Here we are back in our camp with the prisoners and trophies. It is a glorious victory. It will rejoice the hearts of our friends everywhere and give new life to our hitherto waning fortunes. Washington has baffled the enemy in his retreat from New York. If he does nothing more, he will live in history as a great military commander. The colonists' first victory after declaring independence on July 4th, 1776 was significant. And we're going to identify the state on the map in which that victory occurred by selecting the correct hotspot. So we're back into the hotspot selections uh, that we've done before. And um, we're thinking about Trenton, Battle of Trenton. So we're on our little muddled, <laughs> hard to look at map is the Battle of Trenton. Does anybody know what state that is? I'll give you a hint. He crossed the Delaware River, but he was not in Delaware. New Jersey. New Jersey. There you go. Yep. So right here, Battle of Trenton. This little yellow spot right here, it's going to turn gray for us. Battle of Trenton, New Jersey. Okay. We should be able to hit submit. Yep. Lights up green for us. And number three, or I'm sorry, number four, moving on to number four. So here, uh, same passage is talking again about Washington baffled the enemy in his retreat from New York. And it says, select the correct hotspot on the map that indicates the battle to which Stryker most likely refers when he references Washington's retreat. <clears throat> so you have to do two things here, right? You have to, we know it says, you know, right here, it says the enemy in his retreat from New York. Okay, so the other thing that we have to look for are dates. 
So we know that has to happen before the Battle of Trenton, right, in December of uh, 1776. And there's lots of battles here and there. So what makes most sense is the Battle of New York, this long text right here. The Battle of New York, July through August, 1776. It, it mentioned some individual battles that were basically part of that, like the Battle of Long Island. But the Battle of New York is what we're looking for specifically here. And we submit that. Yep. And we get our green bar. And then number five. Okay, and we get another section of the Declaration of Independence. So this comes after that beginning paragraph that we're all really familiar with. And this one says, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, do in the same and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly put up, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states that have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do, okay? So what is the main idea of the Declaration of Independence? Is it A, to overthrow Britain's government, B, in political loyalty to Britain, C, declare war on Britain, or D, end oppressive governments everywhere? B. B, B as in boy, right? Yeah. Ending political loyalty to Britain. Not trying to overthrow Britain's government. We want them to be able to govern themselves. Uh, it wasn't a declaration of war. The, the Declaration of Independence was not uh, a declaration of war, although Britain certainly, you know, made it that. Uh, <clears throat> and, it, you know, it was only about the 13 colonies. It wasn't about ending oppressive governments everywhere. However, uh, once again, citing history, other our, our revolution sort of sparked or was at the beginning of a lot of revolutions. So the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, a lot of independence movements um, came about after the American Revolution. And a lot of those cited the, 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 the Declaration of Independence. Even uh, Ho Chi Minh in uh, uh, breaking away from the, 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 the French Empire for Vietnam. Uh, prior to the Vietnam War, he was hoping for a lot of help from America, and he makes a speech that, that takes right from the Declaration of Independence, seeking a free Vietnam for him and his people. Uh, so B is in boy for number five. Uh, okay, same passage. Which detail best supports the main idea that the colonists will govern themselves? Um, a, we in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies. B, these United Colonies are free and independent. C, all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is dissolved. Or D, as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war. C? It's A. So we're looking for supporting details of the main idea, right? And the main idea being um, and this one's a little subjective because I think B works pretty well too. Um, but the answer they're looking for specifically here is A. That that's the best detail that supports the main idea of self-governance that we in the name. And you have to, you know, take into account here that they're uh, abbreviating it with the ellipsis, right? Because the whole thing says we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled do in the name and by the authority, right? So it's actually a fairly lengthy passage there. All right, number seven, so six is A. 
seven. Um, okay, and then a new passage. So after declaring independence from Britain, the American colonies set forth to govern themselves. First, however, they needed a plan of government. In 1776 and 1777, colonial leaders wrote the Articles of Confederation, which we've also, uh, we've talked about before as well. American leaders purposefully designed the Articles to limit the national government's power to make and enforce laws. The Articles were adopted by Congress on November 15th, 1777, fully ratified by all states on March 1st, 1781. Some important achievements occurred under the Articles, including a plan for new states in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. However, the weak central government made it difficult for the states to function as one nation. In particular, under the Articles of Confederation, the national government was unable to tax or regulate trade between states. In 1787, American leaders proposed the United States Constitution, which established a strong national government. So, our table, right? You remember tables, columns, up and down, rows, side to side. So, our first column is Articles of Confederation, and it's basically characteristics of each, right? Comparing the government plans from the Articles of Confederation to the U.S. Constitution. So, in row in our first row of government, we know that uh, the Articles of Confederation had a weak central government with no executive. Right under, under that first uh, idea of government for the United States, there was no president. That didn't come around until the Constitution. Uh, so, second, the U.S. Constitution had a strong central government with the president. Right, we had an executive officer, I guess you could say, or executive. Um, uh, um, elected official, executive official to run the government. Uh, the legislature, uh, we've dealt with this before too, one house, one vote per state, right? It was, and then two houses, it was a bicameral uh, house uh, that was uh, put in for the US constitution. So two houses of government, one vote per senator or representative. So think about that, you know, it's uh, under the house or under the Confeder articles of confederation, one vote per state. That was it. So now you have a little more equal representation based on population. A little bit. There's still states that are way, way underpopulated that get representation that doesn't really match like two senators. <clears throat> so, uh, but you get one vote per senator or representative. And of course, uh, the House of Representatives is based on population, largely. Taxes, so collected by states under the Articles of Confederation and then collected by the national government in the US Constitution. Uh, new states were admitted through agreement of nine states based on the Articles of Confederation. New states were admitted through agreement by Congress uh, according to the U.S. Constitution. And then amendments under the Articles of Confederation were agreed upon by all states. And for the U.S. Constitution, they were agreed upon by three-fourths of the states. All right. So uh, on that table and the passage, and based on the passage, which of the following titles best expresses the main idea of the passage? So A, birth of the Northwest Ordinance. B, end of the American Revolution, C, the first plan of government, or D, the United States Constitution. What would be the best title for that, for this piece here? I'm voting for the first plan of government, right? C as in cat. <clears throat> it does mention the Northwest Ordinance, but it, it, it's not about the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, it occurs at the end of the revolution, but this isn't dealing with uh, sort of the aftermath of, of the revolution. This is talking about government. Uh, and the same, <clears throat> uh, we're, we don't get into specifics of the, of the Constitution yet. It's, it's talking much more about the Articles of Confederation. So seven is C, eight 
same passage, same table. Uh, it's based on the details in the table, which act would have been possible under the Articles of Confederation? Uh, would A, representatives and senators vote to declare war? B, the state of Virginia could collect taxes? C, six states must agree to admit a new state? Or D, Pennsylvania receives more representatives than New Jersey? Which one fits best there? What could you do under the Articles of Confederation? It's B, right? The state of Virginia collects taxes. That was one of the big changes. Uh, who's gonna collect taxes? So A, B as in boy. Okay. Same passage, same table. And based on the details here in the table, what is one way the United States Constitution changed the structure of the national government? A, there is no head of central government. B, states are led by governors. C, Congress is head of the government. Or D, a president leads the central government. D. 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 D as in dog, yeah. yeah. At that point, that's when we uh, decided on <clears throat> having a president to, to be, you know, over, I shouldn't say over because it's three equal branches of government, but he's in charge of the executive branch. Uh, and, you know, the president has limited power. He can set an agenda for the country. You know, he is the, our head of state. So he's our uh, sort of main diplomat, right? He's uh, he's the figurehead, not figurehead, but he's the the, the head of state. Um, he's going to meet with other heads of state around the world, and uh, he's the the commander in chief of of the armed forces. Um, but you know those powers are you know his his level of power and and, and what he's capable of doing is shared with uh, the judicial system and the legislative system, um, or uh, branch. So anyway, uh, D as a dog for nine. <clears throat> and let's see. Yeah, so number 10, new short passage here. So after the American Revolution ended in 1783, the United States had a large amount of debt. The situation was so bad that the government could not pay many soldiers for their service during the war and did not know where they would find money to pay government officials. The United States had a national debt of around 40 million and owed 12 million to foreign countries. The individual states carried a combined debt of 25 million, uh, which is like nothing compared to what we see as far as national debt and debt. Uh, abroad uh, today, 40 million. I mean, I, I'm, the Powerball is probably over 40 million right now. <clears throat> so anyway, um, number 10, same uh, table of information. Uh, so based on the details of the table, why would the structure of the Articles of Confederation make it difficult for the national government to solve this debt problem? Because A, only the states had the power to levy taxes. B, there was no president to submit a national budget. C, the states had no economic plan. Or D, Congress had to negotiate for loans with foreign government. C, D. It's A. 10 is A, right? Because without an ability to collect taxes, Right, and since uh, it was it was sort of disorganized, and, and the states have more power, um, there wasn't good ways to raise revenue uh, for you know the central government, and and that was an issue, you know, because as far as the that army goes, um, you know, you, you couldn't pay them. So it wasn't until we could uh, the, that the central government could levy taxes uh, that you could actually build a military even. We still relied for many, many years on uh, militia, uh, you know, to basically be available. And the Second Amendment um, is, is really uh, rooted in that idea where the right to bear arms was because we were going to need dudes with guns to come fight because we did not have a professional army. There was only about a thousand so professional soldiers 
after the American Revolution in the United States. So if we had to defend ourselves again from Britain or some other threat, it was going to be the citizen soldier. It was going to be the militia that needed to do that, and they needed to be armed. Um, so 10 is A. Okay. And 11. So in the summer of 1787, a total of 55 delegates attended the Constitutional Convention in <laughs> Philadelphia. The United States Constitution that they submitted for ratification in September was vastly different from the Articles of Confederation. The Constitution established a strong national government with a president, a bicameral, two houses legislature, right? The House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate and a Supreme Court. The legislature was a mixture of equal and proportional representation. All three branches of the national government were powerful, but checked one another, a system popularly known as checks and balances. At the time it was submitted for ratification, the Constitution had no provision protecting personal freedoms. Many states remembered how the oppression of those freedoms caused the colonies to break from Britain and were concerned about having a strong national government that did not secure freedoms in the new United States. Nevertheless, the Constitution would become law after ratification by nine states. The Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution in 1791. And our table here is showing the dates uh, uh, in the columns, the state, and then uh, the number of votes to ratify uh, in that third column and the dates in which uh, uh, starts the rows here for each state. So um, based on that, uh, based on the details in the passage first, before we look at the table, which small state may have been most concerned about proportional representation in Congress? A, Rhode Island, B, Pennsylvania, C, New York, or D, South Carolina? Rhode Island. <laughs> yep, A, Rhode Island, right? Our smallest state uh, by area, right? By size, it is the smallest state. <laughs> Nevertheless, Rhode Island almost has twice the population of Wyoming. Um, and so, you know, it's like, it's over a million, population's over a million in Rhode Island and Wyoming only has like half a million, oh, like 550,000 or something like that, uh, which is another reason, right? So the, the House of Repres Representatives, your number of, of, of representatives is based on your population. So at least in the House, they receive, uh, you know, uh, what you could say equal, they don't have to worry so much. And that was the other thing, you know, with two senators per state, everybody gets equal representation in the Senate. You get two senators. Uh, some are actually over representative, right? Because Wyoming has the same amount of senators as New York or California that has like 10 times the population more than that, 20 times the population in some cases. So um, it all worked out in the end. Uh, so A, Rhode Island, right, was worried about their representation because they were so darn small. Okay, and now for 12, based on the details in the passage, why might the vote for ratification have been marginal in Massachusetts, because A, John Adams was not elected as the first president. B, the state wanted to be its own country. C, leaders were concerned that personal liberties were not protected. Or D, Massachusetts had few delegates. So right, when they say marginal, it means that it barely passed. It did not have a very wide margin of victory. So why would that be the case in Massachusetts? What were their concerns? <clears throat> How about C as in cat, right? So up here in the passage, it says, um, find that again. 
yes, many states remembered how the oppression of those freedoms caused the colonies to break from Britain and were concerned about having a strong national government that did not secure freedoms in the new United States. So 12C as in cat, and let's see, 13. So which of the following titles best expresses the main idea of this passage? A, checks and balances, D, the Constitutional Convention, C, protecting personal freedoms, or D, from convention to ratification. So what would be the best title there? What is the main idea? D, A. B, the Constitutional Convention. So a little more, it's on the right track. D, as a dog, from convention to ratification, as we deal with both here, right? Ratifying the Constitution after its introduction. So 13 is D as in dog. And our final one, 14. So which of the following best expresses the main idea of the passage as supported by the table? Uh, A, New York and Virginia preferred the Articles of Confederation over the Constitution. B, states had various concerns about tie, uh, about, okay, states had various concerns about timetables for ratifying the Constitution. C, most states ratified the Constitution unanimously or D, New Hampshire's ratification of the Constitution. So what would you say based on the votes, right, in the table and the passage? What is the main idea? B. Yeah, B as in boy, right? States had some concerns about uh, timetables for ratifying the Constitution. They had concerns about overall uh, what the new Constitution would look like. So I'm going to submit it and we'll review our answers real quick. Okay, so number one was B as in boy. Number Two is C as in cat. Three was on the map. It was the Battle of Trenton, right? In New Jersey. That's the more important part. Uh, it was in the state of New Jersey. Four was the Battle of New York. Washington's retreat from the Battle of New York led to uh, his victory at the Battle of Trenton. Number four, um, oh, I'm sorry, number three was Battle of Trenton. Number four, Battle of New York. Number five is B as in boy and political loyalty to Britain. Number six was A. Seven, C as in cat, first plan of government. Eight, B as in boy, only states could collect taxes under the Articles of Confederation. Nine, D as in dog. President leads the central government in the executive branch. 10, A, only the states had the power to levy taxes, which is rehashed from the earlier one about Virginia collecting taxes. So 10 is A, 11 is A. Rhode Island, the smallest state concerned about their representation. 12 is C as in cat, there was concern with the constitution that liberties may be marginalized. 13 is D as in dog, 
from convention to ratification best uh, represents the main idea of that passage. And 14, B is in boy. States had concerns about timetables for ratifying the Constitution. Okay. So yeah, that one was fairly quick today.